and welcome back, everybody, to the Today's Market Explained uh, podcast and video series. Uh, Brian Castle, your host, along with Chris Reardon, my co-host. Welcome, Chris, to the podcast. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, glad to be here. <clears throat> and everybody knows, uh, for who listens, Chris is our Director of Development at Four Star. He's the master of all portfolios, uh, recruiting. Uh, he still loves his Cleveland Indians. And uh, he's got three young children under two years old. Amazing. Chris is an amazing guy. Welcome. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, and, Brian. And, and I'm the founder of Four Star, CEO and CIO of Four Star Wealth. I'm an Eagle Scout, trustee of the National Boy Scout Foundation. Um, and most importantly, chief dad to Quinn and Evan and husband to the amazing Tripti. Uh, so we're going to have a <clears throat> normal uh, podcast. Uh, interview today or discussion just about the markets. And uh, if you like what you're hearing, please tell your friends to listen in. And then also <clears throat> give us a five out of five ranking, smash that like button and uh, make sure that we get as much information out there to others. And by doing that, you help us with that. So today we're going to talk about the markets, the economy and what we see out there. There's a lot of really interesting things happening, Chris, right now. Um, we just had a Super Bowl and uh, we've just been heard on Antarctica, so there's a lot, a lot of crazy things. Chris, what's going on in the market today? Yeah, so from an asset allocation front, uh, a little <clears> bit of change up since the last podcast. International equities is still in the leading position. Actually gained five points um, to 245, so still in the driver's seat really there. Uh, cash is holding in that two position, but it had has kind of pulled back a little bit. It lost 10 points from the last podcast, and it's at 208, so it, it did – pull back a little bit. Um, we had a switch in the third and fourth position. We have domestic equities moving upward. They gained 22 points. That was the big winner, if you will, from the last podcast. So 22 points from the last podcast. It's at 197 and now in third position. Uh, and on the opposite end, commodities lost nine points from the last podcast. It is now in the uh, or is now at 171 and at the fourth position. Um, in fixed income, uh, minus seven points. It's still in fifth at 142. And currencies are still in last, minus three at 125. So uh, in the fifth and sixth, have been relatively muted, but uh, a switch in the third and fourth position. And uh, potentially, if trends do continue, uh, we could see that domestic equities maybe jump cash in that number two position. So that's kind of what we're keeping an eye on next, potentially, um, as it approaches that 200 mark domestic equities. So a lot going on there. Very, very interesting. So the real uh, story then since our last um, episode is that the U.S. stock market continues to rally a little bit here, um, at least on our tally scores. But then, Chris, last week was a down market for the prices for the, for the week. And this week is beginning similarly with a confusing CPI number that we'll talk about here in a second. So um, maybe this is the beginning of that next decline, possibly, or maybe this is just a little correction and we're, we've already bottomed. That's the question. Have we bottomed in the market uh, in October or are we going to go back to new lows? And that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, <clears throat> so, Chris, uh, there's a number of other things happening. Um, this week, last week, was the first week after the January rally when they took te technology stocks up 10% in one month. Um, markets are up maybe 6% as well. Um, and also, we're, ex the, we're expecting in, in 2023 the first earnings decline since 2008. So the market is discounting that. <clears throat> we're in a position where good news is bad news because we did have a good number in the, the, the jobs number. But then uh, the market thought, well, gee, if that good number is so good, then maybe we're going to have to have more rate increases. And that's what the Fed is signaling, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think your, the jobs number for January came out um, a lot higher than expected. I think it was five hundred seventeen thousand. And um, yeah, I mean, the, everyone. Good news is bad news is exactly right. And once when you have that good news, it points to a strong economy, which means that the Fed can can raise rates longer, and and um, the market kind of sells off usually on that. Exactly. So now we have the unemployment number down to three point four percent. That's the U3 unemployment number. And so that would normally say that's a good economy. But at the same time, there are 7 million able-bodied um, male Americans sitting at home on assistance. So there's a lot of people that are not in the workforce. 
So the unemployment rate looks lower, but if those people were back in the workforce, the unemployment rate would be a lot higher. And in, in, in the previous cycle, those most of those folks would be back in the in the employment market. So that would take unemployment to six or seven percent from where it is at 3.4. So there's a lot of numbers that appear to make sense and they may not make as much sense as they appear because of underlying things in the economy. But coming back to that a little bit later, Chris, there are so many weird things going on with companies we wanted to talk about. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond was basically bankrupt, but they finally got um, financing from Hudson Bay Capital. So it's a dilutive deal. Um, the stock is up 100% since the bottom. Of course, it was you know near rock bottom, so that's not a big move. But at least Bed Bath & Beyond is back, is back, right? Uh, but they were losing money, and now they're back. Uh, Lyft is the <clears throat> secondary company in the ride-sharing world, and it almost looks like the ride-sharing world is becoming a one-company industry, and that company is not Lyft. It's, it's Uber. So Lyft uh, was down 36% on an unexpected loss, and they're, they're struggling. Um, also struggling is Disney. You know, Chris, we've talked about this, that there's a major travel boom on. Uh, every flight we booked recently is six, seven, eight hundred dollars. It's very hard to get cheap flights anymore because there's so much going on in travel, but not at Disney because Disney's having a big war with the state of Florida. They've injected politics into their company. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Companies used to just do business and not politics, but some of them are doing woke politics. So the state of Florida is, is pushed back and they're taking away the Reedy Creek. Improvement District, which was created by Walt Disney back in the late 1960s, uh, which gave uh, Disney control of their uh, of their land and control of all decisions on their land, um, like a separate carve out within the state. Well, the state's taking that district away. So they're having a lot of trouble. They've laid off now 6,000 people while everyone else is in a travel boom. Disney is in a travel pullback. So that's not good either. Um, and Chris, after all the excitement of electric, and we may think we've gone a little bit too far with electric cars and everything in the short run, uh, BP announced that they're going to be increasing their drilling for oil. And they're going to be increasing that drilling right in the good old US of A. So America is becoming, once again, the number one oil producer in the world, uh, but on private land, not on public land. Um, so we'll see how that tug of war plays out. And then also big news, Microsoft introduced ChatGPT. There's been a lot of buzz, Chris. Uh, big competitor to Google, isn't it? Yeah, well, ChatGPT, it's, I think they are introduced their version of it um, and Google's rolling out their version as well. But you have a lot of these search engine companies that are like scrambling to catch up with um, ChatGPT, which was the initial um, like AI, I guess you would call it, um, yeah. AI uh, search engine. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, crazy because whenever anyone thinks of search engines or search capabilities, I mean, it's almost, uh, you know, uh, ridiculous because Google has a stranglehold on that entire, you know, everyone even just Google it. It's, it's literally a common phrase now. And it's kind of funny that Google itself got caught kind of with all their resources, with all their capabilities, got caught behind the eight ball on this one. And I think they, uh, Google rolled one out. Uh, at least a temporary one uh, this past week, uh, but we're almost seeing like a resurgence of um, kind of technology, a rush, a gold rush for technology with this this AI. <clears throat> yeah, so Microsoft seems to have first mover advantage in creating a lot of buzz, and if they're integrating that with Bing, their their uh, lesser used search engine, uh, but now um, Bing is expected to start taking market share from Google. And search. So since Google has 95% of the search market, the entire market share comes out of Google. So their revenue would potentially be going down from search. And then it does cost more money to run the AI uh, chat programs, essentially like it's a robotic type feature that will answer questions for you and come up with reason and come up with uh, different ideas. It's quite interesting. Um, but it also costs more to run. So if it's going to cost Google more to run search and run the chat GPT or their version of chat GPT, and then the revenue is going to be going down, that's not good for Google. Uh, so Google has had their way for a long time, and it may be, um, you know, the sun setting on the growth on Google a little bit here as uh, their competitors come right at them in search. 
Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a little exciting, I think, too. I mean, I think um, it's almost been like this kind of lull in technology. We really haven't had too many innovations, um, you know, in that in the tech front. So it'll be kind of cool. I mean, you've seen a lot of people take this uh, AI technology and I mean, you can type in things like build me a resume or write a, you know, a poem, give me, you know, different things. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. Obviously it's still very raw, the technology. So what it kind of evolves to. Well, and back on the electric story, Chris, uh, you have news on Ford. Yeah, so uh, Ford Motor announced this week they're going to be investing $3.5 billion to build a battery plant in Marshall, Michigan. Uh, so that's always positive. It's good to see um, bringing back jobs, especially in the Michigan, Detroit area. Obviously, Ford is from there, so uh, continuing to build up that area. Uh, it's interesting that they're making this investment in batteries. Um, I think, obviously, the car companies themselves are making a big push into EVs, and it's been, a, a, I think, a huge priority for them. Uh, but I'll be interested to see how it pays off uh, in the long run for them, because as we've spoken on here, I think the, the sustainability of e electric vehicles, um, especially for maybe an entire fleet or something is not really realistic. So there's always going to be a component, at least in the very short term or the near term, I would say, uh, for uh, gasoline vehicles. Yes. Well, and then the other electric vehicle company, uh, Tesla, is back up 100 percent. But uh, listeners to the podcast or people watching uh, the market realize that Tesla at one point was down 75 percent last year in the year of 2022. 20, uh, so for to be way, way down to one hundred dollars a share and be up to 200 is uh, is, um, you know, not as exciting as being back up to where it was when it started declining. Uh, from four, you know, over four hundred dollars a share. So, at least the stock is back up, and um, some folks think Tesla is going to, you know, be able to continue to control that market. Obviously, Ford's getting into it, um, but we may have gone a little too fast with electric. Electric cars are obviously cleaner, but um, we were having lots of trouble in the energy markets as a result of that. Chris, you have a lot of economic numbers. Let's go through those. Yep. Well, I think the biggest one to, to kick it off, the highlight that came out today, which is uh, Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th, uh, the Consumer Price Index came out today and it climbed 6.4% in January year over year, uh, which was actually down, so down from the December read of 6.5%. So month to month, it did decrease, uh, but that decrease was less than expected. So it's decelerating uh, lesser than people would have hoped for. Uh, and I think the um, underlying uh, figures of that core inflation, which strips out food and energy, which tend to be a little more volatile, that rose at 5.6% in January. So uh, it's still a pretty high core inflation number. This isn't being strictly driven by food and energy uh, prices there. And the largest portion of this increase was attributed to the cost of shelter or rents, which was about 0.7% of that 6.4% um, number. So, you know, it's obviously that, that 6.4 is a combination of hundreds and of different components and, and subsectors and things like that. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting. I think this is another example of uh, potentially, I don't want to say good news is bad news, but I'd say this is almost kind of the the Goldilocks, the, the medium right there. And, and we still really haven't reached it. And the markets, I know this morning, are kind of digesting originally sell off, then a huge spike upwards, and then another sell off again. So, I think that's going to be the market in the in the near term as everyone's trying to kind of guess how is the Federal Reserve going to take this, and does that mean two rate hikes this year? Does that mean three? Does that mean a rate cut? Uh, everyone's trying to make guesses, and essentially, you know, after every news tidbit of news comes out, they revise their guess. Um, so it's it's a constant moving coin, right? Um, the initial jobless claims came out this past week. They increased by 13,000 to a seasonally adjusted 196,000. Um, but this is really interesting because there's really two sides to it. You have industries such as technology, real estate, and finance, uh, which were you know, have been shedding jobs. They've been announcing layoffs. We've talked about that. Uh, and in fact, especially we've seen uh, some high profile, high numbers for layoffs, especially. Uh, but then, then you have industries on the flip side of it, like restaurants, hospitals, and nursing homes that have been hiring robustly. So you really have kind of two sectors and it's the leisure and the travel sectors that are still and the hospitality sectors that are still 
uh, hiring and, and in some cases thriving. Uh, and then you have technology, real estate, finance, in certain areas there uh, that are really having to cut back uh, significantly. So uh, it's a kind of a weird job market we're currently in, um, but it's really kind of two sides of that are driving it. Uh, yeah. then, uh, the home prices, uh, we got the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller uh, National Home Price Index, and that fell 0.6% uh, in November from October. Um, so we saw a slight deceleration in home prices uh, kind of ending, coming towards the end of last year. On a year-over-year -year basis, that was 7.7%. Um, so from November 2022 to November 2021, home prices rose 7.7%. Uh, but that was down from a 9.2% annual read in October. So quite a deceleration there month to month on an annual basis uh, for home prices. I think one important thing to point out is home prices have fallen 3.6% uh, from June to November of uh, last year. So we are seeing those home prices decelerate. And from you know the data coming out now, it looks like that deceleration is starting to increase um, towards the end of last year. So we could see home prices drop, especially... Uh, to begin this year, uh, if that carries forward significantly. So, um, and then a couple news on the um, kind of commodities front. OPEC raised its forecast for oil demand in 2023, uh, pointed to stronger than expected economic growth out of the US, Europe, and China. So they're hoping for most likely a soft landing, just increased demand for travel, things like that. Um, so OPEC raised their forecast. And then on top of that, the U.S. just announced that it's going to release 26 million barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, we've talked about this on the podcast um, before. You know, I don't know. I think our opinion is we don't necessarily agree with that, especially I don't think gasoline prices are, are as high as they were at certain points. And, and I think some of this is just more of a, a political gimmick to try to keep that inflation muted. Uh, especially for gas prices, which tend to be something that's very uh, high focal point for consumers. Uh, what they use for justification is the U.S. announced it's going to, um, or the Energy Information Administration, I, I should say, I said it's expecting the record March production from the seven biggest U.S. shale, ba US shale basins. So that leads to kind of what you were saying, Brian. I think we're seeing a, a kind of a um, reinvigoration of the uh, drilling in the U.S., uh, for oil, essentially. So uh, I think that's positive. And hopefully in the long run, uh, that, that's going to be beneficial. And then the last little tidbit I'll, I'll, I'll mention is uh, we're seeing a, a metals rally to start 2023. A lot yep. of this is, is focused on China and China reopening, some of these easing of these COVID policies, um, and potentially maybe another building boom there. So aluminum prices are up 10% year to date, tin is up 11%, and zinc is up 2.4%. So um, I know copper is another one to keep an eye on. Uh, that's expected to be running as well. So uh, we're, we continue to see commodities. So, you know, what would that say? We're talking oil right here. We're talking metals. You know, over the last maybe four or five months, we've seen commodities kind of come off a little bit. Uh, we talked about that, the numbers in the beginning, you know, maybe we see commodities base and start to rally again. Uh, who knows? But we're certainly seeing oil act a little bit better and metals, um, industrial metals. Uh, and we've seen uh, commodities fade to a position four out of six on a relative strength uh, schedule, but at the same time, individual commodities are working, like you mentioned, those industrial metals. So uh, there's still some opportunity, but you got to be careful. Um, exactly. <clears throat> and now many folks are thinking that because the Fed, uh, you know, went ahead and said, yes, we're going to keep raising rates. And many people thought maybe the Fed would pivot and start to uh, start to consider lowering rates. Well, they're not. They're not going to do that. And now some folks are expecting CPI to reaccelerate the consumer price index. And with today's reading that it only went down one tenth of a percent, maybe that's a sign that later in the month acceleration is happening in, in inflation and prices. We'll see what it brings next month. So um, we'll see. That would be not good. The, key, the Fed has to whip inflation and uh, inflation will cause a recession if we don't solve it. We may cause a, cause a recession while we're trying to save ourselves from inflation and raising interest rates, but that's preferable than to having inflation and, and um, stagnation in the economy at the same time, the classic stagflation from the 1970s. So anyway, so the, the great job number came out, although it's not as much as people think. 
Um, some people think the Fed is moving too fast. Um, the former Council of Economic Advisors Chairman Kevin Hassett under the Trump administration says they're going too slow. Now, they're going as fast as the Fed has ever gone. The only other time the Fed has moved this quickly was in the 1970s. But maybe that's not quick enough to get rid of inflation. And we've seen with this recent print today, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe the Fed needs to move even faster. Uh, January wages were up 4.3%. So that's a good, good point. But if inflation is still up 6.5 last month and 6.4 this month, we're still losing ground if our goods are still costing more. So, and plus, all these numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics are somewhat suspect. The jobs number, you know, last year they came out finally near the end of the year and said that oh, about 1 million jobs of the BLS jobs numbers were not accurate. So, you know, we're not quite sure what not accurate means. Does that means that uh, they made a mistake or that means that they put it out there and then they would later say it was a mistake and there was an election on. So maybe it was done for that reason. No one really knows. But clearly, some of the numbers coming out of the administration were not accurate. Uh, productivity is down and employment is, is up. Uh, unemployment um, is creating like a classic stagflation. Profit margins are in trouble, and if wages stagnate and price increases slow down enough, margins will go down. Uh, so possibly um, inflation and prices don't go down more. The Fed needs to tighten more, and that's what they're worried about right now. So anyway, that could be quite a toxic soup, Chris. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out um, kind of as things unravel coming into this year, especially. Yeah. So the economy generally doesn't recover until the Fed funds rate goes above the inflation rate. Fed funds rate now is at four and a half and expected to go higher in the next two uh, Fed sessions and inflation is still 6.4. So we have a lot of room to go uh, in getting inflation down and the Fed funds rate up. So it's still, it's still a project to be done. So Chris, um, looking at you know, all this and what does this do to the economy and things that we see out there, a uh, recent survey, Americans say the worst problem for the America, for America, is the U.S. government. Actually, um, while well, easing the pandemic emergencies, but they were also angling to impose masks again and allowing COVID vaccines to be yearly. Question, uh, questioning spending and motives as really un-American. I mean, it's really a lot of the things they're doing are things that we've never really seen in America before. Many Americans are feeling that the Biden administration, and particularly the president, is out of touch. So uh, the president goes to grocery stores and he says, oh, there's no problem here. Meanwhile, the prices are very high all around him. Uh, he touts his electric vehicle tax subsidy while he's in a GMC electric vehicle that does not qualify for that tax break. So kind of a tin ear there. And that vehicle costs $86,000 a year, much more than the average American's income, uh, which is now going down uh, you know, due to layoffs. So it, it's, really, it's really a strange thing that's going on with our leadership in America. Um, and now we're seeing because of the uh, budget, um, the debt ceiling and the uh, extension of the debt ceiling, we're playing a toxic game of chicken. We really need to cut down on our spending we really need to get to a point where we're not running deficits every year because we're adding to a $31 trillion national debt. We've added $10 trillion just in the last five years. So we really need to get a handle on that. And that's an existential problem that could sink America. And so it's really important that we solve that. But meanwhile, they're playing, Chris, a toxic game of chicken where um, the administration says, show me your budget and I'll show you mine. Well, the reason the one side wants the other to show the budget is because then they can see what they're intending to cut and then they can go after them over the cuts. So this is an age old game. This has been done dozens of time, times in the last decades where um, the administration waits for Congress to come up with cuts because the administration wants to raise the debt ceiling. And so that's what we're seeing right now. The federal government was able to extend the uh, debt ceiling discussion through some technical maneuvers until later in the spring. It actually needed to be raised in February, but it, it hasn't been. So, so now we're gonna see that little play out. Uh, the ratios of 120% uh, 
of, of debt to GDP is one of the scariest in the world, and it's a real problem. Um, on the positive front, however, the Biden administration, Chris, has held talks with India about moving manufacturing from India to China. And uh, this week, we had, it was the week of all the balloons, right, Chris? How many, how many things got shot down uh, up in the air? I think we had four, I think, reported. Um, so, you know, it's um, you had the, obviously the high profile one. That I think traveled almost all the way across the country before it was shot down out of uh, South Carolina. And then I think a couple in Alaska, one over Michigan uh, near Lake Huron. So a lot. And I know one of the increases, I think a lot of people are kind of like confused. I think people are speculating aliens, things like that. I think, you know, could these balloons, spy balloons have been up there for a while and our radar systems just weren't tuned to detect them because most of our radar systems are tuned to detect fast moving um, bombers and obviously fighter aircraft, things like that, that are moving at, you know, a certain speed, certain altitude, you know, sometimes a balloon that's moving really slow and is very small, it shows up, if it shows up, it's a tiny little blip that they may just disregard as, you know, uh, disregard as something else or just, um, you know, um, mm -hmm interference if you will i guess the word i'm looking for so you know it's interesting and obviously it's driving tensions between the u.s and china uh so it'll be interesting to see what that what that leads to uh, in the coming months and then i think that obviously leads to what you're talking about with um you know relocating things potentially to india yes we should really only do business with countries that are not trying to destroy us uh, and china has uh, outwardly said that they want uh, to be the leader in the world and and they think america is weak and by judging by the maneuvers with the spy balloon thing, we made it look like we're very, very weak. And now the administration, because they're taking a lot of grief over that, they're shooting everything out of the sky that they can uh, to try, try to look tough. So we'll, we'll see where all, all this plays out. Um, but you know, the spy balloons are a good example of why we need to maybe not work as closely with China on everything and work with other countries. So um, on the, also on the positive front, uh, we have an, a, a lot of capitalism and democracy coming into countries in Europe. Everyone knows in the last number of decades that Europe has gone more and more socialistic with the, many of their governments. Uh, we saw it happen in the Netherlands now where there's, where there's a capitalistic, uh, more conservative group coming in to run that country. The new Czech president is a freedom warrior. Uh, China is a strategic threat to them. And so they're pushing back also on Russia on Russia is trying to push initiatives in, in the Czech Republic. And uh, we had some discussions with some Czech officials about that specifically. So Russia is trying to create a big influence and big forces in the Czech, Czech Republic, and they're fighting back. Um, the prime, new prime minister of Italy is also someone who comes from a more traditional background, not a socialist background, and she is pushing for reforms, financial reforms in the country. So it seems like now, while we're seeing a socialistic trend uh, in America, uh, we're seeing it actually go back in the other direction in, in Europe because they've been dealing with it for a long time. Their economies have not been strong. And so they're looking to uh, these new leaders to change the trajectory of their country. India had that happen with Prime Minister Modi, who uh, made some of the new policies in India in the last five years much more economically sound and that helped the country grow. And so we're seeing that, that trend in Europe as well. Um, Europe, however, is, is following the U.S. in their aggressive interest rate increases, sir. They're about six months behind us on that score. So we're going to keep forging ahead to try to you know, get rid of inflation. Um, you know, one of the things that's happening in, in the economic world in America is that we're seeing more and more uh, political views invading economics, where we're pushing uh, concepts like ESG, uh, other woke policies into all walks of life. Well, now the studies have shown that ESG as a concept, if you only do ESG related companies, they don't perform as well. There's been a number of studies that have shown that, but yet governments are trying to force that, but there's been large pushback now where certain states are removing themselves from investment firms that are pushing ESG. The government, however, the US government is trying to push that as well. So there's a big tug of war that's going on right now. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, back to the fuel discussion, Chris, much of Europe canceled fossil fuels very, very rapidly. And now as a result of moving too quickly, 
we mentioned this on the podcast a number of months ago when I visited in Port Portugal. Um, <clears throat> England is burning coal and wood for energy. And that really wasn't what was intended for this winter. So now uh, they moved everything to electric so quickly and they ended up having to go back and burn coal and wood. So that doesn't make much sense. So that's just a sign that they went too fast with their conversion. They didn't really analyze it since it really wasn't about economics. It was about politics and global warming. Kinder Morgan, however, in the United States is supplying liquid natural gas to the UK. So some American companies are profiting from that uh, and other countries in Europe, not just the UK. So while everyone believes that electricity is certainly a cleaner uh, source of fuel, um, you know, we're moving perhaps too fast. Uh, natural gas and others can be stored when the problem with electricity, it has to be used when it's generated. So um, we're now seeing a big a bit of a pushback on that, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I think you could, you could even argue, though, that, you know, although certain aspects of electric vehicles are cleaner, um, you know, right now, at least as it stands, the, where that electricity is coming from is <laughs> not clean. Uh, and then also the creation of those electric vehicles in some ways isn't clean. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, you know, to get these, these minerals, these materials to, to create these vehicles, would we'd have to mine a lot of uh, land that we might not necessarily want to do. So um, there's a lot of uh, aspects of it, I think, that, that are uh, missed by some of the general public. Absolutely. Well, in, in, in more, more evidence that uh, politics has been invading economics, you know, the New York Times a uh, very liberal paper has been in finally announcing that, admitting that the lockdowns during the pandemic never worked and it became much more political and also the masks didn't work. Now the we saw the CEO of Levi's, uh, a lady who um, got, got into a big fight uh, with the New York Times. She lost her job over the issue because she advocated for not having lockdowns uh, and not you know sending all her people away from the Levi's factory stores and whatnot. Um, she got ousted for it, and now it turns out she she was right. Uh, so she's very angry, and there will be investigations. So that's all happening now that we have a split Congress. Um, AT and T the other day also dropped Newsmax, which is known as a more conservative station, and it's more cancel speech and blocking uh, free speech. So um, again, this stuff keeps happening. Um, we're seeing uh, in the State of the Union address this past week where the president is saying statements that are really not accurate. Uh, inflation is coming down, he said, but yes, it's still very, very high. And the Fed is still gonna be raising rates. So inflation isn't coming down as much as it was. And certainly this recent report, Chris, that you, you gave us, down only one-tenth of 1% 1 month over month is not a good sign. So inflation's high, it's gonna to hard to get it down. And, and the Biden administration is trying to make it look like, oh, it's coming down, so it's okay. It's not okay, and it's gotta come down. And also that wages are growing, but yes, wages are growing, but not as much as inflation. So we're still behind. So even though it might be positive, it's not positive until it turns positive and it's still negative right now. So all these measurements by the administration to make the economy sound good, is that working, Chris? I mean, is that, that's the question, do people buy it? And 35% of Americans right now in a recent survey say they're better off. Um, that's the worst number since the Great Recession of 08, 09. Over half of the country say they are worse off, and 80% say the condition of the economy is poor. So, Chris, I, that would tell me that the, the public doesn't buy this, do they? No, I mean, I think that everyone sees kind of what the, the writing in front of their, their, their eyes, really, right? I mean, uh, prices are going up. I think that, you know, the political tension or geopolitical tensions out there as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of things going on right now that haven't happened in some cases ever. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you have balloons getting shot out, shot down out of the air by F-22s. <laughs> you have a lot of crazy stuff going on, I think. Um, the one positive thing I would say is I think, you know, with this January move, I think some people are starting to feel a little bit more optimistic from that bottom as far as the market's concerned. But I think, you know, you have layoffs, you have, you have a lot of negative things going on in the markets right now. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we like to be, at least I like to be optimistic here. So hopefully we see that turn around. Um, hopefully we see things kind of rewrite, uh, but it might take a little bit to get out, out of the system. Yeah, we still have a big, uh, a big bugaboo on our back, if you will. 62% um, of respondents to a recent Washington Post survey 
say the, the current administration has not accomplished much, little if anything. And a recent survey of the president's own party, 58% of his own party say they want a different nominee in 2024. So again, I, I think the president, the public's not buying it. Even his own party's not buying it. Spe State of the Union speech as a result was the least watched in over 30 years. Only 27 million viewers, Chris. And normally there's over 40 million viewers uh, for a State of the Union address. So people are losing interest in politics. They're losing interest in this administration. So uh, we need change, it would probably, and we need change badly. So we'll we'll see if the split government will bring that. Yeah, we will see. I mean, hopefully, and usually it tends to at least kind of grid things to lock. We're seeing that right now with the um, potentially raising the um, uh, uh, budget or raising the debt limit, should say. Uh, so you know, there's positive aspects of it, but um, it definitely has to be more of a middle ground government. You know, with the split split houses. Sure. Well, Chris, that's about all that I had, um, and uh, maybe we can leave it there. Uh, we do want to put a shout out to uh, the folks in Syria and Turkey, uh, wishing them well on the recovery. There were thousands of people that passed away, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it was a very sad. Um, yeah, you know, it's. I think it also just points to some of the the building, <laughs> building violations, things like that. That there, because it's it's very sad what everything that, that's happened over there. I think last I saw about 32,000 was the um, the official count out of uh, Turkey alone, another about 6,000 out of Syria. So uh, just horrible scene over there. And, you know, we wish them the best. And then yeah. the last thing I'll note is uh, congrats to the Kansas City Chiefs um, for winning the Super Bowl, which was uh, on Sunday this past week. It was. Um, well, thanks folks. Um, don't forget to check uh, the blogs. Uh, we did we did a piece on the artificial intelligence network about ChatGPT recently, and there's a couple of other really interesting interviews uh, with a couple um, unique players in the economic system. Uh, so uh, have a look at those on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple, Apple iTunes, and other services. And uh, that's all we have for today, Chris. Why don't we leave it there? Uh, we will be back again in a couple of weeks with an update and a couple of other interviews. Sounds good. So thanks everybody. We'll leave it there for the day for uh, Chris, for our entire four-star team on the East Coast here in the Midwest and the 30 advisors around the country. Uh, we'll leave it there and we wish everybody the best. We'll be back with another episode. Thanks so much.